Good evening, everyone. My name is Bo Manry, and I would like to welcome you to tonight's live Q&A session with myself and my business partner, Chris Goff. Now, for those of you joining us for the first time, let me just welcome you. We're glad you're here. We get to do this just about every week, and it's that time that we get together with our REI Pro users and get their most pressing questions answered. You know, we do this as a benefit for free. It's not a time for any kind of upsells. It's all about pure education. So if you're here tonight for the first time, we're glad you're here. And if you're here as a repeat, we're glad you're here as well to share in everything that we're bringing you uh, tonight. Right before we get to the questions, I thought this was interesting. We had a guy, Jonathan, email us in, just rave and said, look, I just wanna give you guys a review. And uh, we thought we'd share that tonight because it's something that happened this week and stuff he's got going on. He just said, look, I just got my first check for $5,000. He's had two deals fall apart over the last year, took several breaks, decided now it's time to get back and not be fearless. And he's closing with a $10,000 deal uh, tomorrow, actually. So he's just saying he could not have done this by himself. He's partnered up with um, different people and REI Pro has played a major role in being able to do that and becoming successful. So he just wanted to give us a shout out and say, thanks for the quality of the data, talking with the sellers and all the education we provide. So uh, congratulations, Jonathan. And we wanna show these things just because letting you guys know that people are out there doing these deals right now and you can go do it too. First question tonight uh, from Bobby, are there any pitfalls of listing a property on the MLS, specifically wholesale opportunities? Well, good to hear from you, Bobby. Um, Bobby's been kicking butt lately, Bo. <laughs> I know. Um, he, so, he has, hasn't he? So, yeah, I mean, that's awesome. You know, it really is a good question. Um, you know, obviously putting it in the MLS is going to help expand the exposure, um, or is it not? So let me just kind of give you some points first, and then I think you can come up with the conclusion here. If you put on the MLS, and we're not talking about having a realtor list and all that, we're just, we're going to add it to the MLS. You could get bombarded by other realtors. They're going to think that you own it. So you might get, you know, a ton of calls about listing the property, number one. The big thing you have to worry about, if you put it on the MLS, all of the investors that use agents are going to see it. And the agent's going to expect a commission. Okay, so that you have to plan for. That you have to account for. And just putting on the MLS doesn't necessarily, hey, that's a good thing. It's where the MLS puts it. So otherwise, it's going to be in the hands of a realtor that you're not technically the owner because you're just wholesaling the deal. And um, I could see that you might have to negotiate their commission on that. So definitely be careful of that. Normally, when I put a property on the MLS, it's, it's we rehabbed it. You know, um, there's other great marketing places to find those investors from Aria Club, Zillow, Craigslist, just branding your website, things of that nature that uh, will build that investor's list for your wholesale deals. So that's my two cents on the MLS. Awesome. Next question from Gene. I'm looking forward to marketing my business. Please, do you know someone or a developer that can help with a website app or Facebook page? Someone who's reliable. Thank you, Gene. A uh, great question, Gene. Thanks for sending that in. You know, a lot of people, they have this same question that you have when they're first starting out. And heck, even a lot of experienced investors have these questions when they're trying to scale their businesses. You know, uh, when I got started, I didn't have a website. I don't think Chris had a website uh, for many, many years. And today, though, I would encourage you to at least have a corporate main website. Doesn't mean you have to have all these landing pages that you're doing a lot of pay-per-click squeeze marketing and all this kind of stuff too, but at least have that corporate website. Now, developers, since you mentioned developers, uh, they can get rather expensive, uh, but if budget's not a concern and you truly want something that, you know, is unique, then by all means, go out and hire a developer. I can't, you know, specifically recommend an individual developer per se, but there's a ton of them out there and you can look at places like Upwork or Fiverr or developers for hire, and you can just go out and search and you'll find one uh, that's willing to build something for you that'll suit your needs. But for a lot of people who are getting started off that don't have a budget to hire a developer and build something custom, you know, go out and use Carrot websites. 
Um, they have, they're very specific to real estate investors and agents, and they've really built a proven system over the years that really helps with all the things that, you know, you're going to run into like SEO friendly pages and they even have their marketing channels and dashboards built into it and it's specific to investors. And the, the other thing that I really like about them is they spent the time with us because of our shared user base to build a direct uh, integration with their system to REI Pro. So I can't speak more highly of them as far as just as a company, a really great organization. Um, and I would start there that way. You don't have to go about trying to figure out what kinds of content to put on. Um, what do I need on the website? And they've got a lot of that stuff just baked in. So uh, go check them out. Next question from Keith. How would you handle the negotiations in a lease option when a property needs 10,000 in renovation or repairs to make it rent slash lease ready. Can you give a few examples of how you have handled this in the past? Thank you. Yeah, hey, thanks Keith for sending that. You know, I was actually, when I saw this question, I was, I was really thinking back. I don't think out of all the events, seminars, questions that I get asked, I, you know, I really can't think of anyone actually asking this question before. And um, I mean, it's, we have some answers and things that I've done in the past, but I just don't know if this is one of the questions somebody actually brought up because you always hear me say, don't do a lease option unless the house is what I call livable, number one, right? So it may need updating. It may need, you know, a different color on the wall, but those are things typically I'll have my buyer. But if it's not really livable and we have to put some money into it, it always goes back to what I always tell everyone is never put money into a property you don't own unless you really know what you're doing. All right. But I want to give you some tips here because there's one thing here that is a home run for you. And I know I've done it a few times. So it, I've done it because in when I did it, I really didn't know what I was doing at the time either. But, uh, Number one, just kind of keep it simple, is obviously you need to negotiate a better deal with the owner. If I've got to put money into the property, to me, I at least have to have the buyer's down payment at least cover that expense. If I do that, I want to make sure that my sales price is really good and I'll make up that profit down the road. Okay, so that's, that's just one idea. Um, you could obviously tell people, tell the seller, Hey, look, I can't do anything with your property in its current condition. I need you to either pay to have it livable or contribute to the expense. And again, that could come through some of the negotiations, but here's the thing that I did. Um, it was years ago. I did this because normally I would just do a seller finance on a house like this, but Make sure you write this down because to me, this is like a, a home run answer here for you. And for everybody that's listening, if you've got to put a little bit money into it, I'm, you know, normally I say don't do that. But if you do, because it's a good deal, meaning you got a good sales price, you got a good monthly payment, you got good terms. You could tell the seller that my first monthly payment to you is going to be three to six months from now. So if you're putting a little bit of money into it, you hurry up, get a buyer in there. Part of that down payment money will help pay that back. And then they're going to start making monthly payments three or the first three to six months. All of that goes to you and you wouldn't have to pay the seller. And it's really a win-win for the seller too, if you think about it. If the seller doesn't have the money to put the house in livable shape, what are they going to do? They can't rent it. They'll have, maybe they want to sell it. Maybe they're having a difficult time. Maybe they're just, they need to get that mortgage payment covered, whatever it may be. This might be a good solution for you um, is to delay that first month's payment. And you'll be taking in the buyer's payment each month, which will help recuperate the cost to get the buyer in there to begin with. And hopefully, you know, set the numbers where you're making money on this. Um, but just don't go spending money on houses to fix them up and, and to think that you're just going to get somebody in there, I, I, I would never want that to become a habit. Um, I would rather change the strategy to a seller finance if I'm going to do that. Absolutely. And heck, Chris, you know, sometimes I know I've 
painted some walls or something like that. And a potential buyer's like, well, why did you do that? And they went, they didn't even like the color. So you don't want to waste money either. All right. Uh, next well, no, question. I put from... 50,000 into a house, a lease option house. So, you know, but <laughs> it's a little different. Exactly. All right. So from Cheryl, I got stuck until I watched and realized I could ask this question. Um, I have a buyer cash interested in a address here um, in REI. I skip traced and learned both parties are deceased. Also, the property is scheduled for a tax sale, $13,000. Not sure if it's even doable. Um, what did, I, why did I wait so long to join? <laughs> I'm not sure, Cheryl, why you waited so long to join, but we're glad you're here now. Yeah, because, um, you know, this is, this is actually a challenging question here. Uh, because number one, it, you know, and I'm just assuming based on this question that you want to find a deal and pass it along to somebody in the process that's going through a tax sale. So normally, you're going to have to have proof of funds to even put a bid on the property. Okay, so if you need to get a proof of funds letter, you might want to do that. Um, but I would call the county and find out number one, if you do need to have that. Because if your bids accepted, then you could actually assign the agreement over to your cash buyer and have them actually put up the funds to do it. Now, we could sit here all day long and actually say, well, why doesn't the investor just do that themselves if technically Cheryl really doesn't have a contract with them to actually assign? So that's kind of the tricky part you know, unless this buyer of yours is like just a good friend, they don't have time and they're willing to just maybe pay you a fee for just going and, you know, investigating these deals and so forth. So, um, but you would have to have a pretty good relationship. And if you did that in this particular case, because it's a tax sale, I would do like a promissory note with that particular buyer. Hey, pay me five grand and uh, for helping you work this deal type of thing. What I would really do in this case, um, and I'm just going to go down this, this hole with you here, is I would actually find out the owners next of kin. Like I would get down into, I mean, it could be a cousin, find out who actually is in charge of this property. And I would see if I could go back and make up the taxes prior to the actual tax sale. Now, if you go put that under contract without paying the taxes back, if the county will let you, and I don't know when the date is and all that stuff. So, um, but then you could actually sign the deal. So I would probably go down that hole first before I try to figure out how in the world can someone assign an agreement that they don't have a contract for. And the only way to even get a contract for in this particular case is you're going to have to put a bid on the deal. In order to get a bid, you're going to need to probably show proof of funds. And again, I would call your county to get all the details as far as how they handle their tax sales. Um, but for me, I would actually try to go find some relatives, find out who's in charge of the property and offer to buy it and go maybe that route. So, um, but again, I'm not a huge tax sale investor. Um, I just, it's just too many bumps in the road. And to me, they're just not really that profitable, um, for me to jump on to. So I know they always sound good, Bo, like, mm -hmm. Hey, you can buy a house for 13 grand. Yeah. But then you got to sit on it. Then you don't even know what you're buying. You can't even go and inspect it. You, uh, there's a redemption, there's a redemption period, period and then, then they come take it back from you. And yeah. Cause you really never own it. You're just buying the debt. <clears throat> right. So it, there's a whole process to it. And I guess I've just never been a fan. I, I don't want to say, you know, bad mouth tax sales, <laughs> you know, people have obviously made money with them, but it's just not something I would much rather go find the who's in charge of this property and see if I can even make up the back taxes and buy the property and get out of this mess. That's yeah, I think, and I think it's just what you're interested in too. You know, we like to do fix and flips and whatever and pre foreclosure and it's whatever you're into, I guess. Yep. Okay, uh, let's see. Hope I don't murder this name. Is it Javine Taylor? Hi, Chris. Why don't you ask you directly, Chris? Um, what is the process to keep neither party, the seller or the buyer, from seeing my fee? Thank you. 
So that's what we call a double close. We're actually going to be talking about this in depth in our next wholesaling, uh, our last series. I'm going to show you exactly how to do it. Um, but it would be what we call a double close. So there's basically two closings. I have an agreement to buy with the seller. I have agreement to sell with my new buyer. They're in two different rooms, two different closings, and nobody knows exactly how much I'm going to make. The seller doesn't know that I'm reselling it. The buyer doesn't know what I actually have it under contract for with the seller. So, but keep in mind, there's some places that don't do double closings. And that's why I would want to first go through a real estate attorney. And then second, a real estate attorney that actually does it. Uh, but the short answer, the big answer is a double close and keep your eye out for episode number five coming out next week of our wholesaling. I'm going to explain it more in depth. Perfect. Uh, question from Alfred. Hello, Bo and Chris. I'm primarily doing wholesaling. I'd like your opinion on, on marketing and wholesaling probate properties, which is what I'm currently doing. The pros, the cons, uh, the best and the worst strategies for probates and any tips that you could offer would be greatly appreciated. Well, Alfred, the good thing is, is you know what, we have marketing built in for um, probates right inside of REI Pro. Now, we don't have a national list um, that we have that we provide as the lead, but that list that you're working off of, you can upload it and you can use all the marketing tools to reach out to these uh, situations and potentially cause a uh, constructive deal. Now, the other thing that when this really cool part, you can pull up a property in REI Pro and go use our skip trace service. And when that property comes up, you'll see that typically a deceased indicator. But even if you don't see the deceased indicator, um, you'll get the next of kin. We show up to 10 um, next of kin or nearest relatives, starting with typically what they call the first degree. You'll see a little symbol. It might be a little diamond. That's the, typically the spouse. And then it'll go on down to the children and so forth uh, in that. And of course, the goal here is just to get a hold of somebody that's going to be in charge of disposing of that property. Um, and we've got a few tools there for you to work these probates. <clears throat> Excuse me. George, how do you make an offer on a property when there is zero, and he says, I mean, zero comps. No, yeah, I like, I like how George <laughs> I, like, did I mean, like, zero no, comps, okay? <laughs> when I say zero, I mean zero. zero. <laughs> but um, no, it's, it's it, look, you know, it's a good question. There's obviously, people are going to run into this. Um, usually this happens more in rural areas, but um Either way, it's going to happen, right? So there's just not good comps um, that I can even compare it to. And so what I want to do is just give you some steps. And, um, you know, as I start listing these steps here, I wanted to show everyone instead of just, you know, answering it. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So the very first thing, and most importantly, you need to understand what in the world the seller wants for this because you're going to have a general bar, ballpark idea. So if you're in a million dollar neighborhood and they're asking a million dollars, it makes sense. But if you're in a $200,000 neighborhood and they're asking a million, well, that doesn't make much sense. So before we go down these different ways, I want to clarify with the owner exactly what is it that they want. Um, I'm going to have a general idea. So that's Number one, make sure that we have that. Number two, I want you to go back further in time. Now, normally when we run comps, of course, we wanna see the latest and greatest because 12 months ago could have been a different marketplace than it is today. And as you know, that's gonna be in a lot of cases today. So you need to go back as far as you can and start looking at other properties that might fit in that comparable um, piece there. So number three, are there any properties currently listed for sale? Now, this is never a good approach outside the fact when you say zero, there are zero comps. I always like to get an idea. What are people trying to get for a home here? And understanding that is going to help. Number four, do you know any realtors that might be familiar with the area? Because they're going to they're gonna be a great resource for you when you run into something like this. Um, it, you know, a realtor that's been in that particular marketplace for quite some time, 
is going to have a general idea of what it's worth. And the great thing is, is no matter what we come up with here, you could always ask for a lot less, right? So, hey, my if it, if everyone's saying it's around, and this is just a small example here, a hundred thousand, well then offer eighty, right? So, um, let's move to the next one, number five. Check for estimated values, what we say, what other websites say. I always say never rely on one source when it comes to values and. That's where if we don't have comps, now we're really relying on really not the greatest ways to determine the value. So, in, and if I'm going to do that, then I have to look at a little bit of everything in that case. Number six, I want you to take all of this info and make the best educated guess. That's what I did when I got started. Um, and I have done that numerous times is you're gonna take all of these steps, take the information and start to determine about what it's worth. And then number seven, the very last one, you could get an appraisal, but the downside is, is that it costs money. And a lot of the appraisals are based off comps. <laughs> so if there aren't any comps, it's gonna be hard to get an appraisal or at least an accurate appraisal. And we have seen numerous times where the appraiser only takes MLS comps and not necessarily for sale by owner comps and it throws the numbers off. Um, so, you know, but that would be really the steps into determining what is the value of this. Because if you think about it, if there are no comps, nobody else can pull any comps. If the real tours know that's going to be great. If I can pull some values, estimated values, if I can pull, you know, about, you know, what are people asking for? Maybe similar properties, that's going to help. And I'm going to take all that and determine exactly what this property could be worth. And it's almost like could be worth. Um, so there's some basic steps that I would follow um, when you run into a situation that you have absolutely zero comps. Good question, though. I see yep. other people going, good question, George. <laughs> I mean, it really is. It's, it's kind of common sometimes you run into it. Well, it's looking for the alternative way of actually determining a value. Right. It's not always the best way, but if you don't have the best way available, you have to go outside the box. Yep. And you got to do all the research you can and make an educated guess. Yeah. I mean, when I got started, I was like, I don't know. What do you think it's worth? And they're like, well, I don't know. I was like, maybe 40? I mean, so, you know, it's funny how I did deals and I didn't know half of this stuff, but, um, but you were we, out there doing it though. That's a good thing. Yeah. It, you just got to throw it out there. So, but anyways. Okay. From Brad, when you have a seller, you have been direct mailing and they contact you. Do you add them to your do not mail list at that point? That's what I've been doing, but wondering if I should continue mailing them, even though I have made in-person contact with the seller? Yes. Um, good question. Um, so when I make contact with somebody that I have marketed, I actually move it to my property section. And that's really when I'm working the deal. So if you've made contact with the owner, it should be in my property section. Everything else that I'm just marketing and throwing, you know, I've got big lists in my marketing area. I don't fill up my property section area, properties that I really haven't talked to anyone about. I don't know anything about yet. So the, what I think, you know, your, your big question is, is do you put it in the do not mail list? And I would say that's a great idea just in case, you know, by mistake, you accidentally add it to a marketing campaign down the road and you've already talked to the person. Um, so um, it's definitely a good idea. Um, but the way I do it is I market people. And until I actually talk to somebody or communicate with someone, it stays in marketing. And then once I get, hey, somebody's interested, or, hey, I got your postcard, or hey, I got your letter, or whatever it may be, then I'm going to move it to the properties section. Yeah, and he didn't really clarify because he could have said he made contact 
with the uh, potential lead there and they said, don't call me anymore. And so if that's the case, then yeah, you definitely put it in your do not mail list. But if it's a potential deal, like Chris said, we move it into properties. And if during that due diligence period, we find out it's not a deal, you know, I'm more of kind of an archive person. Chris is a delete person. And so, you know, you have the option to do that in REI Pro either way. Yeah, or a follow-up state. You know, you, yep. you could talk to somebody and they're like, you know, I'm, I, I don't know if I really want to sell this, you know, and I'll say, hey, would it be okay if I contact you in 30 or 45 days? You might be interested then. So it could go into more of a follow-up as well. But if I hear like, absolutely not, don't want to sell it, don't call me again, I just delete it. <laughs> and they're like, I don't even want. <laughs> and then of course I would put it in the do not mail list just so they don't get contacted again. So exactly. Okay, let's see. Hannah, this is a long one, so bear with me. We do have people on the phone. So I like to read these so that they can you know, participate as well. Looking for funding for this house in Youngstown, Ohio. It seems like most lenders do not lend on this $95,000 lending point. Any suggestions besides calling them all? And I'm in the process of currently doing just that. And I have a fix and flip house I'm working on, on obtaining funding for, $60,000 purchase under contract for, 35,000 on the rehab, has an ARV of 175,000. I don't want to over rehab it. The comps do not show if the bathroom shower is tile or prefab inserts. The comps all have shingle roofs, but this house has a visual issue line that will be corrected by metal roof. Does this justify the 20% additional rehab cost? I've had a few issues with the tax info and my REI Pro being different than our local county website. Is there another way to check this rather than checking both for each property? I heard the CDC paused evictions, but I've heard mixed info on the pausing of foreclosures. Do you happen to know? Thank you. I really look forward to these sessions and I learned so much. I know we all have time. I know we all know that time is valuable and we really just appreciate you taking the time. Sincerely, Hannah Paul. Well, that was a lot of questions there packed into one. So I do yeah, have a few hey, comments. Bo, huh? hey, Bo, could, yeah. you, could you read that again? I'm I just can read kidding. the entire thing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but she did pack a little bit in there. Um, you know, as far as lenders, I got a little bit to say on that one. Uh, Cause you know, I've, I've looked at some of those situations and, you know, start reaching out to people in your area. I know in Atlanta and I think they're nationwide, like Lima one, that's one that comes at the top of my mind. They do a lot of lending for things that you're looking for. Um, hard money lenders, but you know, if this is a deal with a lot of equity like that, it doesn't matter if you're paying a little bit of a point up front. Also go to your local RIA chapter. You might can possibly JV with somebody on this deal. There's a lot of people there that are lending money and there's some people there that are trying to do JV deals. So you can go with somebody that might can bring the cash and you're working the deal and maybe you can split the profit. So I'd go one of those two ways if you can't find a bank that's gonna you know, loan you money or seller finance. I'm not sure what, what all you've talked to the seller on that issue. Now, as far as, um, I don't know if Chris, if you got anything on those questions first. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, um, you know, the first thing that comes about is number one, you know, doing these um, live Q and A's is great for our users. And this sometimes is a place for people to connect. So there could be people listening right now, Hannah, that want to go into business together. And, you know, and I think, you know, if you're open to if you're on number one, Hannah, um, you know, if you give us the okay, you know, let, let's put your contact information so everybody can see it. Um, you might actually have a private investor sitting on this call right now um, because I do love private money. Um, I'm not a hard money kind of guy. I understand why it's there. Um, I, I'd rather find private information um, or private lenders. Um, I want to go to the roof real quick because um, if there's kind of a visual like it's going to, people are not going to want to buy it because it's just kind of an eyesore type of thing, um, get a bid on that metal roof first. Um, I'm not sure if you did or not, but I would definitely get a bid on that and then take that in consideration as far as what you're buying it for. Another thing you could do from a financing standpoint is, would the seller agree to finance the 60 grand? 
Now you still got to come up with the rehab side of it, but you know, sometimes it's a lot easier to find 35 grand than it is to find, you know, the hundred grand that you're going to need. So um, that might be, you know, one option. And here's the great thing is that if you do plan on selling it, see, I wouldn't rent it. So I'm not worried about the eviction thing. Now, as far as the pre foreclosure, I'll talk about in a second. But if you could sell or finance the 60, put 35 into it, and then turn around and sell the property, you're only going to do that probably in one to six months. So when you go to the seller to finance the 60, it's not like you're going to finance it for 10 years. Just tell the seller, I want to finance it for 12 months. Give yourself a little bit of leeway there just in case it doesn't sell. And then worst case scenario, if you sell or finance it from the owner, the 60, you put the money into it, you could technically maybe refinance the house to pay the seller off. That puts you in a better situation because um, you're going to get some um, tax-free money out of that. So because now instead of paying you're paying interest, it's a loan, and that's gonna be more tax-free if you did the refi on it. So that might be an option as well. So I know she's, you know, there's a lot of different ways to kind of steer this particular deal here, but, um, and I'll make one more point. Um, the pre-foreclosures being postponed, that's actually great news for us, by the way, because they're still gonna be in trouble, no matter if it's postponed or not, but they're still in trouble. It just buys us more time as an investor to go in there and actually work the deal. So that point of view is actually a good point of view. Um, I probably would not be buying houses and renting them out this way. Um, more of my common way to do real estate investing. Um, it's just It doesn't favor it right now. I would do a lease option, different type of tenant buyer. But just renting it, you know, you could run into some of these eviction issues. Yeah, sorry. I was pausing there for a second because I was having a, a big long chat conversation over here with one of the users. Um, but, he's, you know, they're bringing up a good point here. I thought I'd just throw it out here, Chris. And yeah. I see somebody else saying the same thing. Uh, the first question was, why do you not like hard money? And, um, you know, and I started typing out an answer. No, we, we love private money. Actually, it was a confusion. He thought it was, why don't you like private money? And said, no, we love private money. Matter of fact, we rarely right. ever would use hard money. So then he said, okay, no, no, sorry. I meant hard money. And I was typing out, you know, there's a lot of ways to structure this. One, it's expensive with hard money. And if you can go out and get private money, let's just take for an example, a doctor um, or a lawyer got plenty of money, but they don't have time to go do real estate. And maybe their uh, 401k is not making the kinds of returns. You know, we've done this, Chris, and we've talked to investors we can structure deals where we give them a healthy interest rate that they just can't go get in the marketplace or like with stocks, bonds, mutual funds. And if we structure that properly, we can turn that money several times to ourselves on that same amount of money. So, um, you know, that's, yeah, that's what I, I was actually gonna... comment on like that for how we've done it in the past. And just, it's just, it's just a better way. Well, let me tell you why the, the biggest reason why it's cheaper. And I'm going to tell you why it's cheaper. Let me give you a quick example. And I hope everybody follows me on this because I'm going to try to explain this as simple as possible. Let's just say that you borrow from a private investor, somebody that wants to invest. Let's just say a hundred grand and we pay them 10% interest on that. So over the course of the year, we would have to pay $10,000 in interest and we still would owe the hundred grand. Okay. Now, what are we going to do with the hundred grand? Let's say that we went and bought a house with the hundred and, and you could take any number you want here. You could go borrow a million dollars, but take the hundred grand and I'm going to go buy a house, fix it up, resell it. I'm going to make a profit on that. I'm going to get my hundred grand back because I have it invested in the house that I just sold, but I don't have to pay off the investor because we're going to do it much longer term. So then I'm gonna take that same 100,000. Let's say that I made 25 grand on the rehab deal. Now I'm gonna go take that money three months later and I'm gonna do it again with the same money, okay? Let's say I make 25. Let's say I do that four times in one year. 
I would have profited a hundred thousand dollars and I still would have got the hundred grand that I originally borrowed back because I sold all the properties, right? But I made a hundred thousand dollar profit and all I had to do was pay 10 grand. To me, it's cheaper. It's you're going to build a relationship with people that they may have more money. You know, you start with this. Next thing you know, you if they're making money, they want you to, to keep going, right? Because they're making money. And they're making 10% interest on their money. And I'm just throwing 10% because generally that's what we would do. So it's cheaper. You can, I want to say, duplicate the money over and over and over again within one year. And you're going to make a lot more money doing it that way. So that would be the reason why I would go with private money over hard money. Because if I go to hard money, then I'm going to have points. I'm going to have expense. It's expensive money. It is expensive but, money. But, you know, it's there. People use it. Um, I'm just saying we don't <laughs> use it for that reason. Because there are plenty of people out there that would love to give you some money because they're not making it in the stock market. They're worried about their money. They're not growing their money. You can pay them more money. And as long as you keep doing it, you're going to make more money. They're going to make more money. It's a win-win. Of course, you know, the, the follow-up question that comes real quickly even from Hannah is like, well, how do I go find private money? <laughs> you know, um, ask around. Use the three-foot rule of marketing, which means tell everybody around you what you're doing. Um, ask them for money. You know, I've, I've JV with somebody on a deal and I was basically the lender for a rehab portion on that deal. Um, go to these RIA chapters and talk to people. There are lenders there. There are private money there. I think you just got to get out there and start talking about it. And, and, and there's a lot of people who have self-directed IRAs that can uh, loan money and stuff like that. Okay. Well, I can tell you one way um, that happened to us, Bo. What's that? So how do one of the guys that wanted to uh, be a private lender. So we're rehabbing a house, one of our houses, and our plumbers, what was it, brother-in-law? Brother-in-law, yeah. Brother-in-law. Brother brother-in-law. Just sold a company for like $540 million. And <laughs> they wanted to invest some of it in real estate. And he knew we did real estate. We bought houses. So that was kind of a connection just, you know, just happened just by being out there in doing things. So Yeah, that was just literally a conversation with the plumber going, you know, my brother-in-law's wanting to get into it. He's wanting to learn a little bit too, but I know he's got a ton of money and heck, he's always trying to figure out ways to make money. Let me put y'all two together. And we went and had lunch with him. You remember, um, and sat down and talked about his business and yeah, yeah that was really, that was really good. Yeah. Just Cause there's only one happen. purpose. There's only one purpose for money. Make more of it. Make more money. That's right. And that's where you find the more money you make, you're like, oh no, no, no we keep making more. You know, it's when you don't have any money, it's like, nah, I don't feel like working today. You know, it's, but that's the entrepreneur in you, right? Is you got to keep going and right. it never ends. So, all right. Okay, question. question. Oh, um, Sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, it's all good stuff. Let's see, this is a community of education right here. All right, yeah. uh, Larry, if a house is free and clear, how can it be in pre foreclosure? Chris and Bo, have you guys ever done a flex option or a straight option? Thanks for everything you do for us. You guys are awesome, Larry. Okay, Larry, um, well, if a house is listed on our pre-foreclosure list, then we've got then a notice of sale or list pendant has been filed down there with the county, okay? And so it is going through pre-foreclosure. Now, if you happen to be in one of those areas, and if you're trying to compare that to a free and clear list versus pre-foreclosure, there are a few rare areas across the country where we don't get the mortgage data. So it may show up on a pre foreclosure list, but it looks like it's free and clear because you can't see the mortgage data. we just don't have the mortgage data on that property. Doesn't mean that it's not going through foreclosure. Now, just it may not, it could be a lien on the property besides a mortgage. It could be an HOA that is filing the lien and they're forcing it into foreclosure to get their money. So it could be a multitude of things, put it into foreclosure, but if it shows up on the foreclosure list, then there's, there's a notice of sale pending out there or a notice of, or list pending, lawsuit pending, something's going on um, with that property. Uh, next thing I do is check on the foreclosure tab. When you pull that property up, there's gonna be extra information in there and some contact information uh, that you can go off as well. Now, as far as your question on uh, flex or straight options, yes, I've personally done straight options before. 
Um, it was a simple, you know, purchase agreement with the seller, gave me the legal right to go market and sell the property, go out and find another buyer um, for that. I know, Chris, you talk a lot about straight options, but it's one of those tools in your it's in your back pocket, so to speak. You just don't make a business out of it necessarily. Um, but yes, I have done a straight option. Yeah, it's just because of the seasoning rules on things. <clears throat> Generally, a straight option I'm going to do on a nice house. If you think of wholesaling, right, it's basically the same thing as wholesaling, except I call it with nice houses. I'm putting an option to buy and I'm signing or selling that option. The big thing, and why I don't really teach it anymore is just simple fact of the seasoning rules. A lot of times you might run into a problem because the typical buyer you would sell a nice house to is someone that usually lives in it and uh, their bank may require that you own it for six months and so on. All right, next question from Sean. I recently got three doubles under contract as a package deal and for a really good price, however, they are located back in my home state, which is over 2,000 miles from where I live. The owner has agreed to sell or finance all three doubles for 120,000, amortized over 30 years with a seven year balloon, no down payment. My goal is to build up my rental portfolio, but I am cautious about becoming a long distance landlord. Wanted your advice on should I just go for the short term gain and wholesale the properties? or do I keep them and hire a local property management company? <clears throat> if I had to guess, I could probably wholesale the deal for anywhere between 15 to 25,000. And note, yes, I am still marketing for deals here locally that I can buy and hold, however, not having any luck so far. Thanks for your input on this. Yes, so Sean, um, number one, congrats on the deal. I mean, just um, I, anytime you get it with no money down, that's kind of cool, right? Um, yeah. But, uh, I think, you know, the difference between holding on to it or getting rid of it, in your case, wholesaling the deal. See, to me, that's very personal. It's like, you know, the general questions I would ask is, do you need money today or can you wait for it down the road? Okay, so if you need money today, I would wholesale it, make a little bit of money and then move on. But let me give you some of my thoughts on this. And I actually wrote these down because um, I think they're going to help you out and it's going to help everybody out because I do, this is exactly how I look at it. Um, obviously wholesaling is going to be the easiest thing to do. Um, obviously I'd need to run the numbers, but I want you to ask yourself, and I always tell people, ask yourself, you know, every time I find a property, I say, could I wholesale it? Could I get it really cheap under contract and then sell it really cheap to somebody else to make a little bit of money? I always run these questions through my head. So I'm going to ask Sean this question. I want everybody to, you don't have to answer it right now, Sean, but uh, I want you to ask yourself, if I rent these properties out, how long would it take me to make the 15 grand I would have made if I wholesaled it? And I want you to think about that particular question. If, if you answer it with a, oh my goodness, that will take me forever to make that kind of money then I probably would wholesale it. If you answer it and say, well, I really want long-term passive income, um, that's maybe more important to you, then I would sell or finance it. Uh, but really the big question that you're asking is, can I do this 2000 miles away, right? And um, I'm gonna tell you, obviously you can. I'm gonna give you two pointers here. If you do know somebody in the area that could help assist, go look at the property, take pictures, do those types of things, um, go that route. Obviously, you could hire a management company as well and have them oversee the entire project. They'll even do, you know, they'll even orchestrate the rehabs too, a lot of the management companies. So they can really help you out. It does cost you a little bit more to do it that way, but you are 2,000 miles away. So um, there's a couple of thoughts on there. And as far as choosing, should I wholesale it or hold on to it? Just ask yourself those questions. And uh, I think you're going to come up with the answer. Yeah. And I, I mean, the beauty of it is he's got a seven year deal with a seller finance with no money yeah. down. I mean, that was, well, that's pretty big. Yeah. But well, you know. <laughs> unless you got to put a hundred grand into the properties, right? right? So yeah. Um, and, and I don't know if they're already rented. So if they were already rented, they're long-term tenants in there and it's already cash flowing and you know, who knows? Yep. Okay, Brianna, if I see properties in a decent neighborhood that are boarded up and clearly vacant, 
what is the first thing I should do when trying to make a profit wholesaling? Well, this is a great problem to have, by the way. Like every investor wants a boarded up house in a great neighborhood. This is this is perfect scenario set up right here, right? So, you know, the first thing that I do, and and when you're asking, what are those first initial steps? Is I go to the property quick lookup. I type in the address. And number one, I want to know, does the owner live in the house or do they not? Okay, so if it's boarded up, we pretty much know they don't live there, but the tax assessor may say they live there. Okay, I need to do one of two things at this point. I need to skip trace them, find their phone number and give them a call and see if they'd be interested in selling, find out what their situation is and then move through the executable steps from that point. Or I have to send direct mail to the person. Now, if the tax assessor says that they live there, we need to do a, we need to do a list made on this because we need to check to see if there's a change of address on this particular person. So um, I would definitely want to run the marketing through list made, uh, which you can do in REI Pro, clean the list up, and then market them that way. So, you know, the, the, always the question that we have is, I have a property, it's right in front of me. I need to find the owner. I need to find the person that's in charge. Another thing that you, if you struggle finding somebody to talk to about this property, the owner or whoever, I would talk to the neighbor. Find out what's going on. Um, I couldn't tell you countless times where we talk to the neighbor and they'll tell you all kinds of stuff. They'll tell you where they are. They get, may even have their phone number, um, the situation that they're in and so on. So the first initial steps is to pull the property up in REI Pro and then move to step number two. And that's either call them or market them with some direct mail. You could also talk to the neighbor. Now, once I talk to them, you're literally gonna run through executable step number three, then number four, number five, and you're gonna go through until you actually close the deal. Yep, you know, that's interesting you said the neighbor because that's exactly what I had to do on one of mine because I could not locate the owner. I just go knock on the neighbor's door and it's like, I'm whipping out there. You know, I've got their son's information. Hold on one minute. They give me all kind of stuff. Yeah, we actually did that in, uh, what was it, February. So I was in um, South Florida with one of my students, Steve, which, man, he had a, you know, home run deal down there. Two of them back to back, by the way. And the, he's rehabbing a house and the neighbor's house was, man, it's falling apart. I mean, falling apart. And then we saw the neighbor to you know, the other side of the house and they were out mowing the yard. So we walked over to them and asked them about the situation to find out the guy was handicapped. Um, his wife left him like three years ago, depressed, and he, he needed to sell. And that's what the neighbor's telling us. While we're talking to the neighbor, he pulls up in the driveway. So as soon as he pulls up in the driveway, we walk over there and start to talk to him. And, you know, we obviously got to approach it. You know, you just don't go up to somebody and say, Hey, you want to sell your house type of thing. So, um, but, you know, talking to the neighbors, you can find out a lot of information um, and uh, what's going on because a lot of times even the owner won't tell you what's really going on. All right. Oh, I was muted. Sorry. Okay. Um, Keith. Can you explain in detail how to assign a lease option agreement as these transactions appear to be complicated outside of escrow and require a greater level of trust? Yeah, so it actually took me a minute here um, to understand the question because is it a question on just the steps? Um, and obviously you can go through the lease option training series or is it more of a question of, does the seller trust me to do a lease option? Um, so, you know, it's those two scenarios, I think is all wrapped into one question. But at the end of the day, yes, you have to build trust. You have to tell people what you're doing. It was always a question when I got started with lease options. Do I tell the seller what I'm doing or do I not? <laughs> 
And um, I've tried both ways. And I found out the best way is to just be upfront and honest. Like, hey, I've got a lease option program. I help buyers that are in this situation. I work with a local mortgage broker to help them. They just need a little bit of time and we kind of handle everything. Kind of look at yourself as like a management company. So if I can introduce the strategy to the seller from that, a lot of confidence, I'm going to build that trust with them. If I build the trust, then the steps are as simple as we outline in our trading video is okay put it under contract. I need to find a buyer. I need to put them under contract. So, but just keep this in mind, Keith, when you sign the agreement with the owner, I always like to say, you're the one responsible. So if you don't find a buyer, yeah, technically you could back out. But usually when I tell somebody that's what I'm going to do, you do it. Even if you don't find a buyer, you're going to make that month's payment. You're going to put the down payment. So I think it's our job to be upfront and do what we say we're going to do. And if we follow those basic steps, we're really not going to escrow until the new buyer buys, right? So we're just doing these at a kitchen table. But at some point when the buyer does buy, then we're going to go to escrow. So I also want you to think of what would a seller do if they just rented their property? They would... I mean, they do a basic credit check, they get a security deposit, and then they give them the keys. I mean, th to me, that's pretty difficult to trust um, from that point of view. You're kind of doing the same thing. On top of that, not only do you have a rental agreement, you have an option agreement to buy. And so that's really the only additional piece here. So um, I, I, I think your question may be steered more to the level of and how we approach that more than the actual steps. Um, but the actual steps, I go into extreme detail in our lease option training center that you can find in our education center. You know, Chris, I, on the reverse of that, I had, a, I had a, a buyer doing a lease option with me that asked me something kind of similar. And it was more of a, I used to rent from a builder that couldn't sell the property. And so she's paying all this money every month. The next thing you know, six months later or a year later, I mean, it was a year later, there's a knock on the door and it's a sheriff kicking all of her stuff out. She had no idea that it was even going through foreclosure. So when I was doing the lease option with her, it was more of a, Hey, how am I going to be assured you're going to make the payments to the bank? It was one of my houses, you know, and um, I'd showed her a few payments, you know, that I was making after a couple of two or three months. I mean, that kind of fell by the wayside. Just once we had that relationship that you're talking about, that trust factor was there. So. Yeah, and you know me, every time I say the, one of the most important things you can do in real estate investing is to build the relationship because everything else runs so much smoother when you do that. Yeah. Okay, Tori, I've noticed that I struggle with holding myself accountable. Is there a sort of accountability group on a social media platform for members of REI Pro? If not, would you consider analysis paralysis types like myself thinks in advance. Uh, Tori, that's a you know, great suggestion there. We don't have any kind of official accountability group. Um, we do have obviously a Facebook page, um, but you know, hey, I'll kick this around and see what everybody thinks about that. But um, you know, as far as just kind of that whole accountability piece, I know I've, I've talked to people and one guy in particular, you know, three years down the road, oh, how you doing, man? He's like, oh, I'm still working on that first deal. And I think he had analysis paralysis. He he wanted to come. I saw him every year. He's learning. He's watching a bunch of YouTube videos. But I think he gets so caught up in what happens if I fail, and he thinks that way. He's already failed ahead of the time. So he's not actually taking action. So you definitely need to get past any kind of fear factor, I guess, because you'll never make a deal happen if you just don't get out there and go do it, so to speak. But, um, you know, find a if there's a friend out there that wants to do this with you and see if y'all can hold each other accountable. But uh, as far as the REI pro, I'll kick it around with everybody. We'll see who knows. You might have something in the future come. Yeah. I always, I, I actually, you know, as I'm listening to you, Bo, um, I turned it into a mental game. And so the first thing that I would do is I would take a post-it note 
and I would write down everything that I'm going to do tomorrow in the business. It didn't, I didn't know if it was the right or wrong thing to do, but it was something to do. And I would write it down on a post-it note and I would put it in my bathroom mirror. And as soon as I went to bed, I would read the list. As soon as I got up in the morning, I would read the list. And then I would turn it into a mental game like, hey, I'm going to go find, I'm not stopping uh, my driving for dollars until I find at least 30 properties or 30 potential. I'm going to keep going until I did. And then when I get home, I'm going to keep making, I'm going to challenge myself to, I'm going to just keep calling. You know, I was like, I don't even care if they say no. I'm just going to keep calling. I'm going to call as many as I can. And my goal is to do this many. Like I was on the phone. I was like, do you want to do the deal or not? Like I didn't even really care. I was just like, I was going to get to my goal, you know, at the end. So I, I always turn this into a mental game. And, and that's it probably challenged what started, myself. That's to, probably what stuff started it. happening for you. You just started, you know, when, when you do that, those exercises, and you, you know, read a lot of this in books too, about, you know, writing it on your mirror or whatever. You read it in the morning, you read it at night. And, you know, what that's really doing is it's, it's planting seeds in the subconscious mind that start to take over. And when you start believing that you can actually do it, it's amazing how things just start kind of going in that direction. It's just, it's, it's oddly weird. I'm getting chills talking about it because it's, it's happened to me to the point where I start believing, no, I'm going to go do this. And then avenues just start opening up. It's really weird, but you got to believe in yourself that you can get it done. But Bo, isn't that the scariest thing? See, people are not scared for the seller to say no. It's when they say yes. Kind of like, like that. Oh my gosh. Oh Lordy, like when you, what do I do now? Kind of like you, you know, were, uh, you were my out. coach back, what, in 2008? And we're sitting there across from a bank. And then I know it's a story for another time. But when that bank said, yeah, oh yeah, I'll, no problem. I'll lease option to those 50 properties. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm walking out the door going, oh, what just happened? You know, no, now, now what are we going to do next? You know, I wasn't scared to go in there. I knew the lady. It's, oh yeah, sure. No problem. So. Yep. That's what they're scared of. Okay, uh, Sean, let's see here. Tori, nope, now we're on Sean. If yep. the seller lives out of state, is it required or do you recommend that I have the seller notarize their signatures on the contract? Also, if the property is located out of state, how do I file a memorandum affidavit to protect myself from the owner still selling the property to someone else? Thanks. Yeah. So, hey, Sean, uh, uh, again here. Um, so number one, just the contract, just so everybody knows, it does not have to be notarized at all. Okay. When it goes to closing, the closing agent is going to make sure that everything does get notarized, but the actual initial contract does not have to be notarized. Okay. Does it hurt to have it notarized? No, it's just not very common that we would actually notarize the contract to initiate the deal. It's more at the closing side of it that we would actually use a notary. Um, now, as far as the affidavit, which is a good question here because you don't live in the area, so you're, you're out of the area, it is gonna be very difficult. Here's what I would do. This may be the best moment of time to ask this question too. I've never personally done it, but everything is moving online. Like I couldn't even get, you know, I couldn't even get water turned on to my house without scheduling an appointment, right? So everything you got to schedule, do online as much as you can. I'm wondering if call the county and you could have the affidavit notarized anywhere, okay? It could be at your bank. It doesn't matter. You can get that notarized. You don't have to do it down at the county recorder's office where the property is. I would call that county and see if they would take it faxed or emailed and you could pay with a check or if they have an online bill, you could pay there and see if they will actually record it that way. So that way you don't actually physically have to show up to that particular county. Um, so I would call them and ask them and, and knowing the times that we're in, you know, they don't want people coming in almost, right? They'd rather do things online. So you might actually have a really good shot. Like I said, I've never personally done it, um, but that would be the way to do it. All right, Bobby, 
Hey, fellas, I'm just wrapping up or just finishing up with my second deal. Congrats, Bobby. I had an opportunity to walk away with 30,000 wholesale deal, $30,000 wholesale deal. I submitted the contract number one to the attorney, had contract number two signed by my new buyer and in my inbox to send, I called my attorney to discuss setting up the double close and escrow, but he said he typically closes on the first contract, settles the accounts, then later that day closes on the second contract, cashing me out. He said, I have to bring all the funds to closing to purchase and then I own the property before the second can happen where I can sell it. This would protect me in the case, this would protect me in case the new buyer backs out. Do you guys know of a creative way where I won't need the funds and could use the new buyer's funds or do I need to always have funds available? I decided to take the assignment, make 15,000 instead, I guess, all in all, not a bad day. No, I mean, congratulations, right? 15 grand. I mean, usually Bobby's rocking and rolling here. So, um, you know, the easiest answer is to find an attorney that does double closings the way we want them done. Um, but let me kind of expand on this just a little bit um, for everyone, because if you do run into a bank or not a bank, but a, an attorney that doesn't do double closings, you know, my first thought is go find somebody that actually does. It's going to it's going to save you a lot more money than buying it first. Number one, you got to have the funds to do it, right? So you got to buy it first and then that gives you the right to turn around and sell it. But, um, you know, there was a couple of things in here that I actually took some notes on um, that I wanted to share with everybody. So I'm going to just read it here. Um, one of the things I would do is I would explain to the attorney um, that he could close with the new buyer first because all the funds would then be wired into closing and then go close with the seller because nothing's actually going to ever get filed until both of those documents and both closings have happened and the money sitting there. Um, yes, the, you, you kind of mentioned this one thing. This, why, this is the number one reason I would have you find a different attorney. So if I were coaching you um, doing this particular deal, and let's assume that you just didn't take the 15, um, yes, the new buyer could back out, but the seller can't. So we should always close with them first anyways. But I think the attorney has this a little backwards, right? So um, if you buy the home first, what he's saying is, that, hey, Bobby, if you buy the home first and your new buyer doesn't actually buy, that's going to protect you. How in the hell is that going to protect you? You just bought a house and now you're stuck with it because your intention was to sell it right away. That's not protecting you whatsoever. That's actually protecting the seller. So I think his philosophy is already backwards to where I would probably go find somebody I mean, else. Go to find another with. attorney. Well, and I'm hoping this is not like your brother or your cousin now that I've said that. But um, <laughs> so here's another way. Um, actually, I have a couple of different creative. You want something creative. Um, so another way, obviously, you could do what's called one-day funding, um, where they'll literally fund it for that day. So now the closing attorney has the funds wired in there. You can turn around and actually resell it. You could probably get some hard money, but private money, as we talked about earlier, private money is going to be pretty good. Just keep in mind, it's going to be a little more expensive to go uh, that route. But another way to do it, which I'm going to say this with extreme caution because I do not want this to become a habit. And I don't want anybody to come back and say, well, Chris said to go do this. But to me, <laughs> what you could do is actually seller finance the property for 30 days. Just tell the owner that, hey, if you, and it's gonna be a little expensive to do it, but it's not gonna be nearly as expensive because if you could have made 30 grand instead of 15 grand, um, you would have done it this way. I would see if the seller would sell or finance it, get the deed, and then in the same day, close it. And although you have 30 days to do it, you're just allowing yourself 30 days in case something closing got delayed or something happened, right? Or if you had to throw another buyer in there real quick. If you got the deed with no money down, or you can put a thousand down, right? And then you're going to tell the seller, finance this to me for 30 days, it's only 30 days and then they're going to get all their money. 
you could then legally turn around and sell it to your new buyer. Neither party would have a clue what you just did. Okay, so that would be the most creative way to do it. But again, we're really talking about the basic fundamentals of seller financing. It's just knowing when to throw it out there, I think um, is the best thing. But I don't want people to get into a habit of doing that. Okay, because- I can just see some people going, <laughs> on that one. Oh, you think they got lost on that one? Nah, okay. we got good users. They know what they're doing. So the easiest thing to do is find a different attorney. How's that? That's an easy one. Okay. And I'm, and I'm seeing I'm seeing some people come in here and I and I'm I'm recognizing some names. I think that are realtors. And there's like, yeah, you need to close with the buyer first, then to go with the second or with the seller. Yeah, that's that well, that's that's how ninety-nine point nine percent of the transactions actually go. But when we do double closes, that's not how it goes. <laughs> right. um, and there are tons of closing attorneys. There are tons of title companies that do double closing. So um, you just got to find them. And I think that's, that's really the important part. I'm glad to know it was not your brother, Bobby. <laughs> there you go. All right, last one, and hopefully we can take a few questions. Um, Perez, have a seller with a laundromat and a house for sale, was wondering how to go about structuring the deal. It's a big house built in 1920, needs a lot of repairs or a lot of repair work from the inside out. So does the laundry mat. It's 2250 square feet and has old washers and dryers. None are in any, none are any good. Sellers willing to do a package deal. Yes. Um, this is actually a pretty good cool deal. So um, <clears throat> it, it, without knowing all the numbers, let me just kind of tell you what I would, here's my first thought. So I'll just say it that way. Um, number one, you'd want to sell or finance the properties, but separately. Don't put them together because you put it together and you decide to do something to resell and they got to sell the whole package back together. So one idea that, you know, I was thinking about is seller finance the house and the laundromat separately. Then what I want to do is actually go fix up the house and resell it. I'll take some of the proceeds. Number one, I'll cash the seller out on the house. So that will be good. I'll then take some of the proceeds and put it in the laundromat. Then I'll use the laundromat as more of a cash flow property. Um, and again, I don't know any of the numbers. It may not even make sense for cash flow there. I don't know how much exactly in repairs, but just think of that concept. So what I wanted to do, um, Perez, is actually break this down. I want people to actually see the, what I just said. So. Forget about the laundromat for a second. Everybody focus on the house. And I'm just throwing random numbers here, Perez. You could go in and actually fill in the exact numbers. Um, but let's just say that we bought it and keep in mind seller finance. We bought it for a hundred grand, just basic numbers here. Rehab, I'm just gonna throw out, it costs 40 grand, other costs 10 grand. So we have $150,000 totally invested in this. Now keep in mind, you're financing the house. So it's not like you got to come up with the whole 140, 50,000 and dump it in. You would just need the rehab and other costs to this. So total investment. And we would do this deal if the ARV was 200. So that would leave um, a selling price probably with negotiating, you know, 190. You profited 40 grand. Now you take that part of that 40. And in this case, I'm just saying, let's just take half of it. Take 20,000 and put it in the actual laundry mat. Okay. So this would cash the seller out on the home, and then you could fix up the laundry mat for cash flow. Depending on how you look at this, you just bought a free laundry mat that will cash flow plus another 20 grand in your pocket. So again, these aren't going to be your exact numbers, but I want you to, I want everybody to kind of understand, start thinking about this concept here because it's actually fairly simple, um, is focus on the house, but do two seller finance agreements, one for the house, one for the laundromat, okay? I'm gonna fix up the house, I'm gonna resell the house, I'm gonna take the profits, put, in the, put part of it in the laundromat, and I'm gonna use the laundromat for cash flow, and then I would try to go like five, 10 years on the laundromat with the owner. Now, the owner was originally using it probably for cash flow, so, and then it's probably, you know, it's depressed now. It needs to be, you know, updated, um, new washers, dryers, and everything else. 
but you want to make sure that it's in an area and that it's going to be a profitable deal before you go down this road. And again, I don't know the numbers. <clears throat> you would need to put in the numbers, but you think about it, you really just bought a laundromat for free. Now, still you're going to owe the original debt, whatever you're buying the laundromat for, but you're not paying off the debt. The people that are putting the quarters and dollar bills into the you know, the dryers and the washing machines and any upsells that you do at the business is actually paying the debt off, not you. And that's kind of the cool part about this whole deal is that you make a little bit of cash and now you have basically got a free laundry mat and you're gonna cash flow. And again, this cash flow would have to be good in order to do the deal. So, but think of the concept, plug in the numbers and see if that would make sense. Well, what I like what you just went over more so than really just the numbers, although that was cool. It's, it's really the thought process and it's getting people to think creatively of how could I make this deal work and stay where a lot of investors would just go bypass on the deal. Or they would figure out, Oh, I got to go buy, I got to go get hard money. Get the money, hard money cash. I've got to, yeah. If anything out of tonight, I, I saw some common things here is to really throw out the seller financing because man, you've just saved you a lot of money um, out of your pocket. If you could, you know, do more seller financing. So. <clears throat> All right. So we have gone a good hour and 15 minutes, but uh, we do have some questions. Now for those of you who typed everything into the Q and a panel, I really appreciate it. I'll do my best to look at some of these in the chat. If, if you put one in the chat, it would be really helpful if you threw it in the Q&A panel so I'm not looking all over the place. Okay. What do we got? What do we got? All right, let's see how many of these we can get done. Sean, if I have a property under contract located out of the state, do I have to hire a title company from that state or any title company I choose near me? Um, you know who I, uh, Chicago title. They're actually licensed. I believe they're licensed in all 50 states, I believe. Um, but check with Chicago title. Yep. And I know some attorneys that they're licensed in other states that can yeah. do it across because I got one doing for me right now. Yeah, but it's not a big deal to use the title company where the property, the FedEx, no. the paperwork to you, you'll get it notarized and FedEx it back to them. So it's not a big deal to use one locally either. Right. All right. Uh, Steve, for someone just getting started in wholesaling, how long should we give it before we expect to see results? Also, what is a reasonable budget? That is so different for everyone. Ooh, it took it me three months nonstop getting out there. I didn't know what the heck I was doing, but it took me three months to get my first deal. And then I did 46 the next seven months, uh, or around eight months. So um, it's different for everyone. I've had people, and I can only <clears> speak for my students. I've had students do a deal within the first couple weeks. I've had students that do deals in you know, the first few months. Um, so I think it's different for everybody. I think it depends on how much time you put into it, how much dedication you put into it, how much knowledge you have, um, you know, how much belief you have in yourself. I know that sounds weird, but you know, a lot of people are insecure and they're too worried about what's gonna happen or what's gonna go wrong versus what's gonna go right. So you know, it's different for everybody. Um, I think the matter of just finding that first deal, no matter how long it takes, is just putting all your effort into making it work. Think about it. If, if this business were so easy, everybody would be doing it. Everybody. Mm -hmm. So you just put the time, like you guys are putting the time in tonight. You know, you want, you want to hear this. You want to be a part of something. You want to, you know, get some answers. And those are the people that are going to be successful. And you're here with us. So, you know, that, that shows a lot because there's a lot of people right now watching Thursday Night Football. I actually recorded it so I can go back. But it's just, you know, it's, sometimes it's just, it's not important for people. And um, I one thing that I think this goes back to the, not to make this a long answer, is to go back to that accountability question. I forgot who asked that, Bo, but if you have a hard time holding yourself accountable, to do, don't do it for you. Do it for someone else. Do it. Think about your, your son, your daughter, your spouse, your mother, your aunt, whoever it may be. 
and do it for them. And if you you'll do be it, you're, letting, you're letting them down. Yeah. Yeah. It's a mental it that thing. Way. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Susan. Next. I've done some fix and flips and lease options. I'm thinking of getting my real estate license, possibly broker as well. Do you think it's a good idea? I know sure. it's not necessary for investing. Just curious of your thoughts on this. As I always appreciate you guys very much trying to decide where my time and money should be spent. Coaching from you guys is probably a much better idea, I'm sure. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, if it were me knowing what I know now, I mean, I would put all of your money in your education. Um, that's why people ask me to coach. They ask other people to coach. It is literally going to be the fastest way. It's like why we're here tonight. People want to have that quick answer. Um, just because, you know, you're, you're looking at the, you know, people that have experience in it. But, you know, we're still learning too. It, it's a, it's a never-ending process to learn. Uh, but to get your real, you know, real estate license is totally fine. You know, you've got a little bit of experience now. Um, it's going to give you access to some more information, especially expired listings, things of that nature. Um, you're going to build some more relationships with people. Um, so if you can hang your license with a broker, I would say yes. If you're going to go work for a broker, I would say that's going to be a problem. Yep. You know, Chris, just following up on that, a lot, of, most people, a lot of people know that you were my coach when I got started. That's how we actually first met. And, you know, I got a coach because I, won. I wanted the accountability too. I did not want to make the mistakes. We're all going to learn one way or the other. I don't want to make the financial big mistakes. And I wanted to hire somebody like yourself that would make sure that I would do it the right way and hold me accountable as well. So I can't speak more highly of putting the money in the education. That's, that's the thing because I know I can go do this over and over and over again. I've already spent the money for the education, but you can't take it away from me. So now I can just kill rinse and repeat. So, yeah. And I saw Myrna was on, Hey Myrna. Myrna. I haven't, Myrna was a student of mine as well. She's an awesome lady. And uh, I've got a few more gray hairs, Myrna, than I did when <laughs> I saw you last, but uh, I'm glad you're here. All right, Mike, I live in an area right, that right. home sale in one to two weeks. When I ask sellers about a lease option, they ask, how can we make sure that the tenant buyer does not wait? How can we make sure that the tenant buyer does not buy it now when they're willing to sell it in four or five years? What verbiage can we use to the tenant buyer options contract to make this work? Houses in my area generally eight hundred thousand to one point six million. Okay, so this this is actually a really good question. It, it's it's very rare <laughs> somebody would actually do that, but. Um, also, I would find out if they would sell or finance it because if they're looking more for a long term, that could be a good thing too. Um, so th they're open to the idea. They want to do a lease homes, but they don't want their buyer to buy right away, right? Is that what I'm getting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they want to buy. In, they want them to buy in four or five years from now. So your buyer, you, I always say, don't go longer than twelve months because if you do a original agreement longer than twelve months, then it's not technically a lease. Um, you, not for residential. Commercial, you can do as long as you want to. Um, and then you could do an extension, extension, and so forth. But what happens if your buyer buys, right? I would actually, so you said four to five years, a seller finance would be the most ideal. You use it as an income cash flow property. Um, and you, but you could always put verbature in the agreement. I just don't like the whole idea with lease option on a four to five year term. I'd rather see the seller finance on that. Uh, but if you do need to put some language in there, it's just as simple as wording it in a way that, hey, the tenant buyer cannot close on or before this particular date. I don't know why in the world they would want to do that. So you would need to probably get a credit from the seller. You would need to pass the credit to the buyer for a reason to not buy it now. Um, so I don't really like that whole concept. Um, now that I'm talking about it, I would probably sell or finance and maybe try to go that route. Or it's just not a deal for you, um, that particular seller. You there? You're on mute. No, I can't hear you. And unless it's me. Can you hear me now? Somebody there can check. You can hear me? Okay. Under the properties tab, what do you do with the maximum cash offer? 
once you get that number, who is it for, the seller or the buyer? I inadvertently gave the number to the seller and found that it was too high. Um, so if you fill the all cash offer form out, that's gonna be in step number four. So we're gonna make a cash offer, either be wholesaling or retailing. Um, that maximum cash offer, you wanna start a little bit below. So if that maximum cash offer was too much, then we need to relook at the numbers, um, what numbers we actually filled in. Um, usually that number sellers are gonna say that's too low. <laughs> so, um, but you wanna, that is your maximum offer to the seller. If you're wholesaling it, you're gonna add your assignment fee, whatever you plugged into the formula, back to that number and that's what you would sell it to the new buyer for. So the maximum all cash offer is gonna be going to the seller and then you just simply, let's just, let me round it off. Your maximum all cash offer is 100 grand. We put it under contract with the seller for 100. Now to, in my actual formula, if you put, hey, I'm gonna make five grand as an assignment fee, your wholesaling fee, I'm going to sell it to the new buyer for 105,000. So, and again, with the seller, you'd want to start a little less than the maximum cash offer. And with the new buyer, I'd want to start a little bit higher than the 105 for negotiation. All right, Susan, my LLC has been set up and a website, but I could use a more professional website. Also need a professional email and a phone number. Do you know where I could get all three in one place? Trying to simplify. Also for the business address, I have a PO box, but of course that won't work for everything. I don't wanna use my home address. I do have an extra lot beside my residence. Thinking of putting an office space there, your thoughts on the subject. I don't live close to large cities, et cetera. Well, if you've already got your LLC and you've already got a website, I'm assuming you already have a domain, whether it's registered with GoDaddy or somebody. Um, anybody out there that has that domain are gonna offer professional emails, I guess you just, well, you would get an email with your company name, number one. And most all of those companies have some type of email platform where you can keep your personal email, like a Gmail separate from, you know, that particular email, they have a office 365 account or something like that. As far as, you know, trying to get it all three in one place, the phone systems and all of that. Um, you may not be able to get there's I'm sure there's companies that do all three. Um, I know with my stuff, I have things well, that I like. Does. GoDaddy uh -huh. does. Yeah, GoDaddy they have all has three. websites they got, too. They got the phone so. number uh, management piece and everything. Not, not the phone number, but they can do the yeah. website. The, you know, oh, they the, do the website. They do the email. They do a lot of that stuff um, there as well. So and a lot of the P.O. Box places, um, you can go to some of the, let's say like a UPS store. They have a physical address. It's, it is kind of a P.O. Box or a sweet number, they'll call it. And they actually accept deliveries for you. So you might could do that versus having to, you know, do something on a lot next door. Yeah, I don't know of one place. It's, you know, the, some of these companies, they do one thing really good, but this company does this really good. So it's really finding those things. We should actually, Bo, do a video of like, here are the companies we use. Here's the website builders we use. Here's the, you know, the email Home companies. Systems we here's, use. Here, here's the camera that I use. Like, when I shoot video out, um, which, you know, I, I love people doing short videos, putting it on YouTube, explain to people how you can help people from a pre foreclosure, or you're trying to build your buyers list, you're looking for private, whatever it may be, is doing these short videos. What camera do you use? What microphone do you use? What, you know, what do you guys use? Um, it might be actually a good idea to uh, put together everything we use you know, when do we use our, you know, phone camera versus a, you know, a, our Sony camera? Or, and why? <laughs> or, hey, if, um, you know, one of the cool things that we do, because we're not really perfect, is I'll use a teleprompter um, in some of my short videos where I just, I know what I want to say, but it's sometimes hard to look at a camera and actually say it. And, you know, what company do I use for some of those videos? Um, and it's really cool now. They actually have one. Oh, that's um, so they got one for your phone now. There's an app here. I'll tell you guys right now while I'm on it. Huh. It is called Teleprompter. It's an app you can put on your phone. It's one of the coolest things. So 
if you guys are shooting video on your phone, you can literally read the script right off your phone. It, and this is perfect for you guys to put those videos up and share with people how you help them in this business. So and get a uh, testimonial with video as well and put that up in your YouTube channel on your testimonials page on your website, a little bit of social proofing there. Yep. Um, Cornell, my buyer wants to use their title attorney. He requires separate monies to perform the transaction. I have two weeks to obtain transactional funding. Any suggestions? Mm, that one's well, hard. I mean, you said the you said the right buzz where they're transactional funding. You need to find a company that'll yeah. just do that. You know, that'll do it just for an hour, five, a day, week, whatever it is. Um, and they're out there that'll do it, especially if the numbers line up. And that, you know, and it also goes back to why private money is so so good. Oh yeah. So. Um, you got some comments coming over here. It's like, hey, how can I get someone to mentor me? That's Javine asking, how can I get? You may be asking, how can I get Chris to mentor me? Chris and Bo, can you help me? How, do, how would you reach out if they need to apply, let me just say? Well, you can put it in the box there, coaching at my REI Pro. Now, for some reason, a lot of you are not getting the response that's going to your junk mail. So if you do inquire, I will send something uh, back to you. I'm usually fairly quick on that. Um, and if for some reason you don't get it within a day, then you need to check your junk folder. Um, and then um, I'll also follow up with you as well. So. Now I can send you all the, I can send you some of the details. We only, we only coach so many people at a time. It's not like the back in the day um, where I had tons of students, mm -hmm. like tons of students at one time. And that just, that was overwhelmed. <laughs> okay. From Brad. Hey guys, I'm working on a seller finance deal on a mobile home where the seller is a realtor. She wanted to see my contract, which I sent. And she came back asking if I would use her realtor contract, the GAR, uh, would you do it? Why or why not? So the GAR form, I'm assuming you're in Georgia. That's the GAR form. Um, you know, a lot of our contracts, Chris, they're just simple. Now, these are talking about probably seller financing, which is let the attorneys do all that stuff anyway. But the realtor contracts have all the do's, things you can't do all the time. Well, if you're, it was, I didn't hear the, the beginning. Was it a seller finance? It's going to be a seller finance deal in a mobile home, but she's a realtor and he probably had a one page contract saying, I'd like to sell her finance and here's the terms. Yeah, but she's wanting to translate contract. all that crap over to yeah. a GAR form. Yeah, th that's not a problem. It's, it's when you're going to wholesale it. You need to make sure you have the right to assign. So they'll put in, you know, paragraphs where you cannot assign this contract, but with seller financing, you are going to buy it. So it's no big deal. Uh, Jeff, hello. How often should I pull pre-foreclosure notice of defaults? Uh, depending on your area, I would recommend just in general for everyone, at least once a week. You know, if you're in a, if, but let me, if you're in a, like an area where you normally have like 13, you can probably go every other week, but just keep in mind that time is of the essence, right? Normally time is of the essence. Right now things are being postponed. So you do have a little more time, but still things are still, you're going to see auction dates still being scheduled right now. So. Uh, Sean, when we add property, when we add a property to properties from a campaign, how do we now remove it from that campaign so that we don't market to them again? Okay, so if you have a property in the marketing campaign and you say add two properties, um, you can just, uh, you, there's an option there that says delete. You can take it right out of your uh, campaign. Yeah, and if you don't want to market to them again, put it in the do not mail. I'll put it in the do not mail list. Yeah, you um, can do that as well. That's the safest way probably. For yeah, and, and then there's a, there's a check box right there beside it says add to do not mail. At the same time, it says add to properties. You can do both. Um, Gabe, how do you feel about joining the local BRIA mentoring program? It's 18,000. If numbers make sense, they put up the funds and split the deal with them. This is what they offer in the Broward County, Florida. Yes, I know Ryan personally. Yep, Both we know him personally. Um, so they are very good people, um, by the way. So we know them very personally. I have his phone number and um, we are good friends. So I know what they do. I, I don't really trust a lot of people out there. Um, Ryan, I totally trust, totally. How would you structure a subject to if the seller just wants to sell and is not in any sort of hardship? Repeat it again. Well, I think he's a little confused here, but how would you structure a subject to if the seller just wants to sell and is not in any sort of hardship? 
Well, he wouldn't be doing a subject to if he just wants to sell. He wouldn't be doing the seller finance. Well, if he, yeah, if he just wants to get cash, well, a lot of sellers say they just want to be cashed out, but I'd still make the offer on a seller right. finance. Um, so still make the offer um, or do something different with it. Okay, subject to, speaking of this in the follow-up here, that's a different person, subject to transactions, can a HELOC be involved? How to draw on the HELOC to fix up a property with the buyer or would a HELOC be better under a seller finance agreement? Well, subject um, to and seller finance is the same thing. Yeah. Um, assuming you are the one that owns the property. Is that what we're talking about? That's the way I'm taking I'm assuming, okay, if he does a seller finance, subject to transaction, can a HELOC be involved? How to draw on that HELOC to fix up properties with the buyer, to fix up a property with the buyer. I'm not sure where that's going. I mean, that, yeah, that's, we're going to. I need some clarification on what you're trying to do with that one. Yeah. Uh, somebody wants to know, hi, Chris and Bo, what's your opinion about condos in Miami downtown area? Some have been on the market for more than six months. Is owner Heck finance yeah. even possible? Heck yeah, condos are not a bad thing. If you can especially do anything kind of creative. I'm going to actually do, you know, um, I'm going to write this down. I was talking about doing this and then of course COVID thing came in, but now everything's coming back. I want to teach you guys, we're going to do this. Um, I'm going to teach you how to use creative financing and turn it into an Airbnb. And that would include condos. So if we could buy something on creative financing, condo, house, something like that, um, and turn it into an Airbnb, that to me is a home run. One of my students in South Florida, just north of Fort Lauderdale, seller financed a home. And he's getting cash flow over 10 grand a month. Now, obviously things took a turn with the COVID, but now they're starting to get back on track. This would be a good time to do it. I'm going to make that a note. Yeah. And, um, well, I'm, I'm reading some, Hey, Ellie, this is, this is a really, really long drawn out question here that I, I think we're going to run out of time. For. Maybe, um, submit that question to us next week or on the next deal analysis night that we might do. Yeah, and your um, yeah, and your mic sucks, by the way. Mine does? Or or my internet sucks. Well I've been talking the whole scratchy. time and every once in a while your internet or you start talking and go er, 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 er. Oh maybe it's me then. I think it might be you. All right. Okay. Let's few, um, yeah, let's take a few more then I gotta go. Uh Thanks for the advice. This is Perez. Thanks for the advice. I'm going to try that exit strategy. I'm not sure exactly which one he's talking about. That was um, the last one we did. The last one he said, he'll keep yeah. us posted. Never thought about it that way. You guys are awesome. Um, Sean's just mentioned on the phone company side for somebody else. Grasshopper is a good company for a virtual phone number. Also phone.com. Um, yeah, we, we use phone.com. We use phone.com and have for many years and don't have any problems with them. Very similar to Grasshopper. Mm -hmm. Um Perez, about the laundromats in the house, I was wondering, could I just wholesale each one of them? Yes. Um, or is that not a way to go? Yeah, you could totally yeah, do totally. separate one, wholesale each one of yep. them. I was just getting, I was, that, that's the easy route is to do that. I was just going to throw in some creative ways, you know, just to, for you to think of it a little bit different, but also for everybody else that's, you know, listening in to, it's not just, you know, black and white type of thing. Sometimes you just got to look outside and look around the corner and look at it from a different point of view. And that's what all I was trying to do. Yep. Um, Hannah says, I have a house almost in contract and the owner now wants his friend, a realtor to handle it. I'm planning to wholesale it. Can this still work? Yeah. Cause the seller is going to pay the commission. The seller would be a fool to do that. <laughs> but it's funny. All right. I don't, there might've been some more in chat, but that's, I think that's all we're going to have time for because the ones that are left are kind of long and drawn out. So, well, that's just, I, we appreciate you. Number one, thanks for all that actually submitted the question through REI pro. Um, and, and again, hanging in there and listening to us. Um, we definitely enjoy doing this. We enjoy hearing the great stories um, and the feedback as well. Um, so, you know, that's what this is about. This is a great benefit for you guys that are on REI pro. And um, to me, it's invaluable. Um, you know, just sometimes it's that one answer. It's that one thing you say that sometimes just steers 
a different direction, a new path for you. And um, I know it's happened to me. It's happened to Bo. Um, a lot of successful people out there. It was that one thing, that one tip sometimes that that just does it for you. So um, we're, we're glad that you guys are here. And uh, thanks for being a part of this. And um, we will see you guys next week. Yep. And for Tori, the accountability question, I want you on here the next one, Tori. And I want you giving us a shout out saying, I got it. I got something done. Because I may call you out if I see your name out there. I will call you out and be you will be accountable on the next one. So good luck to you. Thanks, everybody, for joining. See you next time.